Hi there, my name is Guy Hellman, and I'm a second year med student at the University of Queensland. And I'm here today with Professor Ian Frazier, a professor of medicine, currently working at the Princess Alexandra Hospital in the Translational Research Institute. So hi, Professor. Um, it's great to be here with you today. Well, thank you for coming along and talking with me. Um, so I guess to start off with, uh, would you be able to tell me how you got your start in medicine? Yeah, look, I went to university to study physics. But I had a very interesting conversation with my, boy, my pen friend's girlfriend's father, who suggested that perhaps while astrophysics might be very interesting, I wasn't likely to get a job out of it, and that the study of medicine would lead to a more interesting set of research objectives. And how do you think that's gone so far? Well, I can't complain. Obviously, it's been a good life. As far as I'm concerned, I've done a lot of clinical medicine when I was much younger. These days, I'm much more focused on the research. Okay, and uh, so I understand that the medical tradition has kind of continued in your family and you've had two sons who have gone through uh, medicine at UQ as well as a son who's also in veterinary sciences. Yeah, well, even the son in veterinary sciences has now changed to medicine. He just graduated at the end of last year and so all three of them are now graduated and qualified doctors. Oh, wow, and have they followed the research path at all? Uh, unfortunately, they haven't shown much signs of doing that yet, but at least two of them have expressed interest, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> well, Hopefully, you know, it does stay in the family. Um, so I guess, you know, you said you're in your early days that you were uh, working more in clinical medicine. How did you start making the uh, jump? I know, I understand that you worked as a renal physician for a while. How did you make the jump to immunology and then to more of the science-focused role? Look, I think it was the other way around. I was always, as an undergraduate, interested in immunology and that in the research in that area. I mean, I took a year out and did what in those days was a one-year research pro program as part of my undergraduate medical course. When I had to decide which area of medicine I was going to go into, there wasn't in those days anything that you'd call a clinical immunology program, but nephrology was the one place where there was a lot of practical immunology because renal transplantation was at least half of the nephrology program in Edinburgh, and I was very interested in the whole aspect of not only the immunology of renal transplantation, but the immunology of the infections which these very immunocompromised patients used to get. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, you know, very kind of definitely drives you towards that. And so where did things really progress to from there? Um, I know you, or you did come to UQ uh, at some point in the mid 80s. Yeah, look, I studied in, uh, in Edinburgh to complete my training in renal medicine, and then realized that I also needed to complete a training in clinical immunology. And I, as an undergraduate, all of the papers that I had read, half of all the immunology papers came from, came from the Walter and Liza Hall Institute in Melbourne. So I thought, well, I was out there as an undergraduate for a few months one, year, one summer and I thought well maybe they'll take me back and uh, in fact the guy who I'd worked with out there had been waiting for me to come back. He actually sent me a telegram which shows how old I am, I mean nobody knows what a telegram is these days, but he sent me a telegram to say we were expecting you, why haven't you turned up? So I thought well okay and I was going to go and do a PhD in Cambridge. Uh, but decided I'd rather come out to Melbourne and brought my wife out and I worked in Melbourne in the Walter and Liza Hornshoot as a trainee clinical immunologist and completed my formal training in clinical immunology there. But also, of course, uh, that was a place where you did research and I took on a research project, first of all, working on liver disease, which wasn't really my interest at all, but it was my boss's interest. And then from that, the interest spread particularly to hepatitis B virus infection in the liver and understanding why some people could get rid of this virus and other people couldn't. A question I still can't answer, but uh, at least at that time it was an important question because it was be at the time when immunology was beginning to get really exciting. We understood the basic components of the immune system for the first time, but we didn't really know how they worked together. And so I stayed in that area, moved from hepatitis B virus to papillomavirus, and then brought that interest up to Brisbane with me when I came up here in 1985. So speaking of uh, papillomavirus, this uh, June marks 10 years uh, since the, uh, the vaccine has been incorporated into the vaccine program here in Australia. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was introduced in 2007. Okay. Um, so what key steps and partnerships along the way really drove the development of that vaccine? Yeah, uh, uh, we started off, at least I started off, trying to understand why people couldn't get rid of papillomavirus infection. The link between the virus and cancer had been established by Harold Serhausen, but it was kind of puzzling that there was a virus which caused cancer which we couldn't get rid of. 
And I started working on that and realized very quickly that because you couldn't grow the virus in the lab, you would need to be able somehow or other to make an infectious virus to do the necessary studies. So I went off to Cambridge. I always wanted to go to Cambridge. <laughs> Tried to get there as a PhD student, didn't quite get there. They would have taken me, but I had better plans. But anyway, I went back to Cambridge, worked there with Martin Evans at that time, who was making transgenic animals very early stage of that and I wanted to make a mouse that was transgenic for papillomavirus protein. Didn't manage to do that but we did manage to make uh, some of the molecular constructs that were necessary to express papillomavirus proteins and there I met a guy called Jan Zhu who was also on sabbatical there as I was. He came from China and he and I being the foreigners in the lab got <laughs> together and sort of worked, worked out together a plan for making a complete infectious papillomavirus he came back to work in my lab here and along the way we built the papillomavirus shell which became the basis of the vaccine. So that was all done in the early 1990s I guess and we realized pretty quickly after we'd found that we could build the shell of the virus that if there was going to be a vaccine against this particular virus it seemed likely that it would be a good idea then that would be the technology that would enable it. So we went off and sold the, sold the idea, if you like, to CSL, and CSL sold it to Merck and to GSK. And the rest, as they say, is history. My involvement after that part of the process was mostly advisory to the companies that were developing the technology because we'd already worked out how basically it had to be done and had shown that it did the right thing, at least in animal models. And what they had to do was to turn a test tube full into a swimming pool full. And that was very much their business, not ours. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I mean, the vaccine is truly a m r remarkable example of a benched bedside technology. Uh, it's demonstrated protection against 70% of HPV infections uh, that cause cervical cancer. So what's next for your group? Look, my group at the moment is working in two quite distinct areas. One is we're still trying to understand if we can get a vaccine that would be therapeutic against existing papillomavirus infection. In other words, when the immune system's already failed to get rid of it, can we do better with a vaccine? And the short answer to date is not yet. Uh, we're working on it. We understand why we fail, but we haven't yet found a way to overcome that problem. And we have all these wonderful technologies at our disposal these days, which weren't around when I was a medical student. But even with the wonderful technologies, all we can do is to get delve more deeply into why we can't control the infection ourselves and not yet find a way of overcoming that with a vaccine. The other half of what the lab's doing is, is a sort of more up-to-date project. We're very interested in the skin microbiome and how that impacts on the development of squamous skin cancer. We know that skin cancers are very common in Queensland. The, most of the initiating factors are ultraviolet light and the damage that that causes to the DNA and the keratinocytes, the skin cells. But you can get quite a lot of skin, skin damage and it doesn't necessarily progress to cancer. In fact, most people who get the skin damage, they get rid of it themselves. But what it turns out is that the skin that's been damaged, it has this ultraviolet induced damage, becomes host to a different set of bacteria from the bacteria that live on normal skin. And our hypothesis at the moment is that these bacteria are driving the process of oncogenesis forward so that the already damaged skin now becomes both immunosuppressed because of the bacteria and also promoted into more proliferation because of the bacteria. These are hypotheses. The, the colonization of the skin is definitely different. And we're now just trying to work out how the bugs are doing what. Yeah, well, it's very interesting to hear, especially as uh, the kind of one warning that I had when I was moving to Brisbane was the fact that it is the melanoma, or was the melanoma capital of the world. Uh, no, it happens. still is, unfortunately, <laughs> and the skin cancer capital of the world. I mean, the squamous skin cancers that we all get if we are fair-skinned as I am, and you are as well. If you live long enough in Queensland, you'll get skin cancers unless you keep out the sun. <laughs> well, the, quite a bit of time in the library and the lab does kind of help that. <laughs> um, indeed, indeed. So given recent events like the March for Science in Washington, D.C., uh, kind of transitioning here a little bit, uh, what, what do you, and elsewhere around the world, do you believe that there's been a decline in public and governmental support? for research in the scientific community? Yeah, not in Australia. We've been very fortunate here. We're the, our governments successively have increased the amount of funding for biomedical research. 
increased their enthusiasm and now I'm in charge of this thing called the Medical Research Future Fund, or at least I'm not in charge of it, the minister is in charge of it, but I'm in charge of a, a, a committee that advises him how to spend that. And that's going to double the amount of bi money for biomedical research in this country over the next five years, which is a pretty substantial increase. I think things have got harder for researchers along the way. I mean, there are also more people coming into the system, but the support from government is still strong and constant in this country. I note with some distress what's going on in the United States, and my colleagues over there remind me regularly that things are not so good in that, that, that part of the world, but it still hasn't led to them coming here yet. They all threatened they might, but they haven't appeared on the doorstep yet. It might be just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so going back to uh, what you were saying about in your early career where you had an advisor who was working on hepatitis B virus, what would your recommendations be for young researchers who are trying to explore their own scientific interests and curiosities, but more often than not they have a research advisor who does dictate, you know, and this is part of the entire process, does dictate a lot of what's going on in the lab and the resources that are available. Well, look, you've got to choose what you're really interested in. I have always been interested in this very simple ch challenge of why is it that some people get a virus infection and get rid of it, and others get chronically infected. And I've never deviated from that interest right from when I was an undergraduate student. So the, the art in the, in the game is to go where you can best do the work you want to do, and that means going to the best possible institution and getting the best possible supervisor. But if it was a choice between institution and supervisor, I'd pick the institution every time because it's the experience of the people that you work with that determines what you achieve. And your supervisor might want you to go one way, but if, the, if there are all the skill sets that you need round about, you can drive your own program. And that's really what I did when I went to Melbourne first. It's what I did when I came up here. And it's what I always recommend my PhD students do when they graduate, go to the best place in the world for what you personally want to do. No, I think that's fantastic advice. Uh, for those who are kind of dealing with some setbacks in their research, what strategies would you have for them um, in their scientific pursuits? Well, I've never met a student who hasn't got setbacks in their research, so that applies to every student I look <laughs> yeah. after. Look, 90% of what you do is in real science just doesn't work the way you're expecting it to do. So you shouldn't see failure as a setback, it should be as a challenge. But the other thing to remember is that if you design your experiment right, a failed experiment often is as informative as one that you worked the way you expected it to do, because it's telling you something. I mean, if you design your experiment so they're bound to fail, so to speak, that's not going to help you. But if a negative answer is as important as a positive one, you usually learn from that. And the really good scientists are the, the scientists who see something unusual enough that it intrigues them to see if it's repeatable. And if it's unusual and repeatable, it usually leads you somewhere interesting. No, absolutely. So for those of us who are inclined to get on the clinician scientist track early on in our medical degrees, or um, even afterwards, after we've had a couple of years in clinical medicine, do you have any words of advice for us? Yes, it's a tough road row to hoe. I mean, you have to try and serve two masters. And you're always going to be in competition with the people who have chosen just to do the science track. But you have one big advantage as a clinician, and you can always make use of that, and that you have this broad base of knowledge about health and disease, which is missing for most of the people who come into med biomedical research from the science side. And therefore, first of all, you are almost always going to be a more effective leader of a program than they are because you just have the background knowledge. But equally, you have the ability to think laterally because you have to do that all the time in medicine and therefore you tend to be able to see where the advantages lie. You have to accept that you're always going to be part of a team. I mean, look, I do research with a team of scientists with a whole range of different backgrounds, but even they now expect to bureau out quite a large, large part of their science to experts in particular technologies. And that's going to be the way of science in the future. You're going to be part of a team You've got to decide where you fit best into that team. You might be as a leader, you might be as a, a doer, you might be as the person who's got all the bright ideas but doesn't want to be the leader. All of these people have their place. And you just have to, I think, perhaps realize more than was the case in the old days that you're never going to be the single scientist doing the single most important project. You're going to be part of a team of people that are tackling multiple projects at one time. Well, Professor, uh, I can't thank you enough for that advice. I think that's very helpful for myself and other med students who are currently contemplating or on the clinician scientist track. And uh, so thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been great to sit down and talk with you. And well, thank, thank you for the chance to do so. I mean, I want to encourage the next generation of clinician scientists. I'll need them to look after me when I'm old. <laughs>